Hi there. My name is Russell. You may remember me from the evolution workshop that we did in your first year last year. And I'm going to be taking you for the next four weeks um, teaching you about uh, fossils. So this is a sedimentary rocks and fossils course. Everyone on this course, give or take, has chosen a geology or related geology pathway. And as such, the focus of this particular course is going to be on fossils that are useful to geologists that you really should be able to identify in the field and that you can use to say something about the rocks in which you found them. As such, uh, many of the fossils that we're going to be looking at are fairly common invertebrate fossils, so things that you will stumble across on a regular basis as a working geologist. The focus is more on how we can use these things as geologists than on their physiology and biology, which I'm covering in another course that a few of you may be doing at the moment as well, called Evolution and Paleobiology. So without further ado, I'm going to be uh, first introducing uh, kind of what we're going to be doing over the uh, course of the next four weeks in the content that I have prepared for you. So a key question is, how is this going to work? Well, um, obviously COVID is happening. I'm sure you're aware of that at this point, and it is impacting on our teaching. And indeed, the timetable for this course unit was only confirmed about a week before Welcome Week. As such, um, between us, Rodri, Stefan and myself have worked out a uh, setup in which we have hopefully a great deal of flexibility in case we enter lockdown once again. And I have volunteered to provide all of my content remotely in order to allow us to um, deal with the situation in which we go into lockdown. That will give us a four week leeway of this material um, in which uh, we don't have to be uh, on campus, in person, whilst we can work out how to deliver the rest of the course in this fashion, if that were to happen again. So that means that all of this uh, material is going to be delivered uh, digitally, as I'm sure you found, uh, if you're watching this video, you've already visited one of the sites, I've placed much of the content into websites. So there are gonna be two of these websites for any given week. That represents two of the three timetabled hours that we have for this course per week, with the remaining hour being a, a synchronous or an in-person Zoom session in which you can ask any questions you have about the course material for that week, but also in which I'm going to introduce a few more concepts, the more kind of practical things of how we can use fossils to understand rocks and the history of those rocks. So it's going to be a mixture between all of these modes of delivery. Um, and I hope that these will pre be both interesting and quite enjoyable for you. I recognize also that they place a fair bit of onus on you to make sure that you are able to uh, cover this content um, within your working week. I would recommend perhaps that you do it actually within the timetable slots, just so you uh, get into a rhythm of, the, of these things. But how, how you do it is obviously up to you. So the websites will include 3D models that you can click on and then have a look at the 3D models. It's another reason why we have chosen to make the fossils part of this course remotely delivered because it was easier to pr produce um, practicals in this way than it would have been for sedimentary rocks. Um, there are 3D models on this very website, in fact, and I would encourage you strongly, if you have any problems loading those, to let me know sooner rather than later, because I hope they will be very useful to your learning and to actually let, uh, kind of help you understand the anatomy and the morphology of the fossils that we're going to be looking at. So as you can see on the course unit, I've provided some rough timings, uh, the course unit planner, I'm sorry, I should have been clearer, that is posted on Blackboard. I've provided some timings you may want to consider um, for my elements of this course. And I wanted to finish this particular slide by giving you a quick overview of what we're going to be looking at over the course of the fossil units. We'll introduce um, first some basic concepts over the course of the next three videos and this website as a whole. And then for the subsequent uh, websites will be introducing individual fossil groups for you. So those will be the trilobites, the brachiopods, mollusks, corals, echinoids, graptolites, and then we will conclude with a lecture essentially filling in the gaps of everything that I've missed. This will include, for example, plant fossils and trace fossils. 
then we'll have these Zoom chats. And so these will um, not only give you the opportunity to ask questions, but I'll introduce concepts in those such as biostratigraphy and how we can use fossils to tell us about environments. So that's an overview of this course and what I'm going to be providing for you. If you want to learn more about these, a good place to start is with the textbook shown on the left here, Paleobiology and the Fossil Record by Michael Benton and David Harper. It's a, it's a good book. And it's available, importantly, through the library as an ebook. So you don't have to visit the library in order to be able to uh, use this book to read around the subject if you so wish. Indeed, much of my teaching for this course is um, based around the Benton and Harper book in order to essentially make sure that there is a, a source that you can rely upon for all of this information, but also to let them make the decision of what they think is important. There's a whole world of stuff we could be covering over the course of these lectures and letting uh, this textbook dictate which of those are, are the most important is a very attractive way of doing things. So I hope that will um, be useful to you. But if you want to um, read more about any of these, in, these groups in particular, the book on the right by Ewan Clarkson, Invertebrate Paleontology and Evolution, is also a very good source. And that's available through the library, but I'm afraid only as a physical copy. But hopefully by the time you watch this video, you'll be able to get into the library to borrow that book. Both of these are linked from your reading list, which is available via the Blackboard site. If you ever find yourself working on fossils in earnest, for example, um, in industry, you'll probably want to dig into the primary literature. So this, these are the actual research papers that um, are the results of people's research that um, cover the cutting edge of what we know on all of these fossil groups. I just wanted to put that out there so you know it exists, that I won't really be expecting you to uh, explore that too much for this uh, unit in particular. So this lecture in particular is about providing you with the background that you need for the rest of the course, the things that you uh, need as context and explaining some of the decisions that I've put into designing this course because I've written it um, for you new this year. Some of it will be revision of stuff that we covered um, last year. So especially that Rob and um, your practical sessions covered last year. And some of today's content will be definitions, just to make sure that we're all starting on the same page. We'll cover topics including what fossils are, and then a brief history of paleontology as a field, because I think it's really important and useful to know where we have come from to the point where we are now. We'll look into concepts such as taxonomy, the categorization of fossils, and phylogeny, that's their relationships to each other, and how those two actually differ from each other. Um, we'll also look at some basic biology that will be useful to you when talking about fossils. So I thought it made sense to finish this part of the lecture course by highlighting what a fossil actually is. And there's a definition of a fossil on this um, slide. A fossil is the remains of a once living organism. This can include skeletons, tracks, impressions, trails, borings, and casts. So that's a very wide range of different forms that are included under this term fossil. Um, for example, it includes trace fossils as well. Those are the, the remnants of animal behavior in the sedimentary record rather than the actual bits of an animal itself. Fossils are really useful though, and this is why you're learning them today, in telling us about rocks. Not only its depositional environment, so where it was deposited, but also how old it was, how it was related in space to other rocks in deep time. Without fossils, we would really struggle to get this information out of most sedimentary rocks. But it's also useful to study evolution in deep time. And those of you who are doing evolution and paleobiology with me at the same time, um, that you'll, you'll be learning all about this in that lecture course. So we'll be covering a range of major fossil groups um, in this lecture course. An interesting question, I think, is whether we have always, as humans, known about fossils. Well, certainly human interactions with fossils run very deep indeed. 
We know that trilobites were drilled for use as pendants, so jewelry, by early European hit humans in the uh, late Paleolithic age. So that's about 50,000 to about 10,000 years ago. We also know that shells of extinct animals or teeth are sometimes found as grave goods in Bronze Age human burial sites. So uh, an example of this is shown on the left. This is the uh, round tumulus from uh, Five Knolls Barrow Cemetery in Dunstable Downs. Uh, it's a Victorian illustration there. There's a fair bit of artistic license there. But clearly, um, fossils have been of great significance to humans for a very long time. And indeed, there are multiple, multiple folklore traditions explaining fossils. So the, um, the mollusk shown in the middle here, called Gryphir, is often uh, called the toenail of the devil. So this was a folklore explanation for what this um, structure that was found in a rock may be. And indeed, there's a very famous example of one of these folklore tales uh, regarding St. Hilda. Um, so there are lots of Ammonites that are found near Whitby. And the story goes that St. Hilda reclaimed the ground in the Whitby Abbey was built upon from snakes. And the Ammonites that were found in the rocks of that region were snakes that she had turned to stone. The only problem being that the Ammonites didn't have heads. So uh, people have in that part of the world traditionally carved heads onto their Ammonites to make them look like snakes, as shown on the right here. So fossils for humans and for most of human history have had symbolic or cultural significance. An intriguing and surprisingly persistent relationship between humans and fossils has been the use of paleontological artifacts as medicines. And there are loads of examples of this. Echinoid spines, which are shown here on the left, were known as lapides judaceae, that's juiced stones. And those were sucked or powdered and taken to treat renal, so kidney conditions, including bladder stones. Um, fossilized fish teeth, usually from the Jurassic period, were called toadstones and we used to treat many diseases and as an anti-venom. Amber has been used to count ailments from sexually transmitted diseases such as gonorrhea through to mental illness and vertigo and the plague. Shown on the right here are instruments for distilling oil from amber. And on the far right is a lynx because uh, for a long time, uh, amber was thought to be solidified lynx urine. This actually, uh, this use of fossils uh, in for the form of medicine actually continued to, until surprisingly recently. This was present, at least in Europe, still in the 18th century. So a key question then we may face is when did we start studying fossils within a scientific framework? Well, paleontology and in fact geology, the two weren't distinct subjects or when they were born. They were both born during the Age of the Enlightenment. This is a philosophical movement which dominated the world of ideas in Europe in the 18th century. I could, I could talk about this for a long time, but summing it up, um, kind of the Enlightenment ethos was the use of reason as a source of authority. So um, major key kind of key points for the Enlightenment were um, the use of evidence in science, and the um, kind of holding up of ideals such as liberty and tolerance. The latter are summed up nicely by these quotes um, from Voltaire, who was a French Enlightenment uh, figure, which I've put on this slide. So an example is those who believe you, who make you believe in absurdities can also make you commit atrocities. So it was very much about rationality and it was about kind of the, um, the study of the world in a naturalistic um, context. And structures and organizations such as the Royal Society and thus the uh, system of publishing science that we have today um, as a means of dissemination for our ideas were born during this time period. And indeed, uh, the USA is essentially an Enlightenment society. The founding fathers shown in this painting on the right hand side here actually were Enlightenment um, figures. Some of them were Enlightenment scientists and they wrote the US Constitution as an Enlightenment document. Many of the meetings where these, uh, these ideas were driven forward in certainly in most of Europe were in coffee houses and other um, such uh, venues in the 17th and 18th centuries.
So it's a really interesting time period, and it's during this time period that geology came into its own as a science. From this seed, paleontology and geology as a science really developed primarily in the 19th century in Europe. Major names in the early development of geology and paleontology, um, which I don't have time to go into today, but if you have any questions about these people, please do ask in our Zoom session, include James Hutton, who I would imagine you heard about last year, William Smith, who created the uh, first geological map, uh, Georges Cuvier, a master of um, comparative anatomy, who was French, Mary Anning, who um, collected fossils in the UK, Henry Thomas de la Beche, who uh, was a gentleman scientist, and it must be noted it has come to light or come to prominence recently a slave owner, so bear that in mind. Uh, William Buckland, who was a kind of a, one of the earliest superstar geologists, I guess it's fair to say. Charles Lyell, who laid the founding um, principles of much of the geology we know to be true today. Adam Sedgwick and Richard Owen and Gideon Mantle were all early examples of scientists who studied fossils fairly extensively. By the mid-19th century, paleontology was a major, and indeed it was a very fashionable subject. Um, one example of this impact uh, of this and the impact it's had by um, the mid-Victorian era in the UK, so that's the mid-19th century, is the 1851 Great Exhibition that's shown on the left here. This was an um, attempt by the British Empire in 1851 to essentially show off. Um, so uh, we built this massive, what was called a glass structure called the Crystal Palace um, in Hyde Park in London, and filled that with all kinds of artifacts from all over what at the time was the British Empire. Um, it was an incredibly successful and popular event that went on to found um, the leftover money, went on to found South Kensington as a um, place with lots of cultural institutions in London. That's where you can find the Natural History and Museum and Victoria and Albert Museum today. And the leftover money was used to fund scientific fellowships, such as the one that um, Ernest Rutherford uh, was uh, it funded by when he visited Manchester and split the atom in the early 1900s, interestingly. Associated with the Crystal Palace, that actually um, were created to join this building when it was moved to Sydenham in London, um, shortly after the 1851 exhibition, were dinosaurs that were designed by Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins under the scientific direction of Sir Richard Owen, who was the head of the Natural History Museum at that time. Indeed, there was a famous banquet in the mould of one of the iguanodons from the Crystal Palace um, display, shown here in the middle, and here is the banquet on New Year's Eve of 1853. So paleontology as a science was a really major thing um, by the 1850s. And as such, the founding efforts in this field really did happen around the 1800s and the 1850s. And paleontology has developed constantly since then. But many of the founding features that are important to paleontology really got a hold then. You may be wondering at this point why I'm telling you all of this, but I'm telling you this all all of this for a very, very good reason. And that is because I want to finish this video by apologizing. So because paleontology is a Victorian science, it was developed in the 19th century and has roots that run a tiny bit deeper than that. There are lots and lots of long words. We may say it's very sesquipedalian. That's a really nice word. I've put the definition for you on this slide here. So it's a, a, a topic that's characterized by long words or long-winded. Why might this be the case? Well, 19th century scholars often spoke Latin or Greek, or Latin and Greek, and often in fact published their science in that language. So this would explain and help with the vocabulary they invented to label different bits of fossils. But also at this time, science was an aristocratic um, pastime that many people did um, who were rich and needed to fill their time. It was a world of gentlemen scientists. And I strongly suspect then there was an element of using long words to be exclusionary to other people. So other people who were not part of the same social structure, the same social class as those gentlemen scientists couldn't um, partake in this science. I'm afraid also that me though, that means that these long words stuck at that point and they are unavoidable if you are studying paleontology today and as such they will be featuring in this course relatively heavily. 
I'll do my best to introduce them in a sensible way and multiple times. I'll do my best to provide spellings for you and to um, prioritize that vocabulary th that really matters. The stuff that you need to know to kind of seem like you know what you're talking about, which no doubt you will do by the end of this course. So there are some words I'm afraid that you will need to learn and you'll need to be able to use them to be a function geologist. I'm sorry, though, this means that you have to spend some of this time uh, for this course learning vocabulary. Um, as I say, I hope the explanation of where paleontology has come for helps justify why that is the case. It may not be a good justification, but certainly it's a historical precedent for why we are where we are today. So that's it from me for this video. And you can join me in the next video just further down this page. And we're going to be talking about some of the biology that you need to know uh, to have for this, the rest of this course to make sense. Thank you for listening in the meantime.